Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Paula Capasino. Um, I work with, uh, with David uh, in the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health. And I have been asked today to define what um, an, investiga an investigational device is in the context of genomics research. So first, I will uh, go over the definition of the device. Uh, this is uh, from Section 201, Subpart H of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, a device is an instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent, or other similar or related article, including a component, part, or accessory which is recognized in the official national formulary or the United States Pharmacopeia or any supplement to them, intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other condition, or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in man or other animals, or intended to affect the structure or any function of the body of man or other animals, and which does not achieve its primary intended purpose through chemical action within or on the body of man or other animals, and which is not dependent upon being metabolized for the achievement of any of its primary intended purposes. So this is the definition of the device from the Food and Drug Act. Um, the in vitro diagnostic device uh, includes those reagents, instruments, and systems intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions, including a determination of the state of health in order to cure, mitigate, treat, or prevent disease or its sequelae. Such products are intended for use in the collection, preparation, and examination of specimens taken from the body. These products are devices as defined in uh, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And this uh, definition of the device comes from 20, 21 CFR 8093. That is our Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, the term investigation does have different uh, meanings and different uh, parts um, of our regulations. This is actually from the investigational device exemption regulations. So an investigation is defined as a clinical investigation or research involving one or more subjects to determine the safety or effectiveness of a device. Um, here it's important to note that even if determining the safety and effectiveness of a device is not the specific goal of an investigation, if you're learning about the device or learning about its safety or effectiveness, then you are performing an investigation. A subject um, is a human who participates in an investigation either as an individual on whom or on whose specimen an investigational device is used or as a control. A subject may be in normal health or may have a medical condition or disease. So I think it's very important to understand what, you know, the concept of the intended use as, you know, we use the term in FDA. Um, and it's, uh, it's really a very critical to understand, you know, when your device may be investigational and uh, when we receive anything from any company or any investigator, this is the first thing we look for is the intended use so we can understand what this device is and what it is supposed to do. The intended use explains what the device measures, um, and we call this the analyte. The intended use indicates who is eligible to receive the test. Uh, we call this the intended use population. And um, it also includes the indications for use, and that is how the, how the test result is used. As an example, we provide the intended use of the MAMA print. And we have had this slide forever. I wonder if you guys have seen it a thousand times. David asked, actually asked me to maybe to update it, but I didn't have time. Um, so the MAMA print is a qualitative in vitro diagnostic test service performed in a single laboratory using the gene expression profile of fresh frozen breast cancer tissue samples to assess a patient's risk for distant metastasis. The test is performed for breast cancer patients who are less than 61 years old with stage one or stage two disease 
with tumor size less than or equal to 5 centimeters and who are lymph node negative. The mammoprint result is indicated for use by physicians as a prognostic marker only, along with other clinical pathological factors. So in this case, the analyte is that gene expression profile of fresh frozen breast cancer tissue samples. The intended use population are the breast cancer patients who are less than 61 years old with stage 1 or stage 2 disease with the tumor size of less than 5 centimeters and who are lymph node negative. And the indications for use or how the test should be used, it is um, by physicians as a prognostic marker along with other clinical pathological factors. So that's the information that we are typically looking for in an intended use, and it really drives our thinking um, into, you know, what, uh, what types of information uh, to have and, and what kind of questions we may have. So um, taking all of that together, for us, an investigational device is the device that is the object of an investigation. For example, if the use of the device is included in a clinical protocol, then the device may be investigational. So that's sort of a first step, is if it's being included in a clinical protocol, um, then it may be investigational. How do you determine if the use of the device in your clinical protocol is investigational? If the device is not legally marketed, for the intended use or indications for use identified in the clinical protocol, whether or not it's been previously cleared or approved for a separate intended use, then the device is investigational. We uh, distinguish investigational use from off-label use or practice of medicine, and uh, investigational use requires an exemption from pre-market approval requirements for new drugs and devices. Some examples of medical devices include instrumentation, in vitro diagnostic kits, reagents used for laboratory testing, uh, maybe some apps, you know, although we recognize that most apps would not be considered medical devices, depending on what these do, they could meet the definition of a medical device. For example, if someone develops an app that actually uh, makes a diagnosis, then it would be likely a medical device. And software uh, can also be a component of a medical device. Medical devices are subject to regulatory requirements, even though they may be only investigational. So we try to uh, give you an idea of what we would consider the device in terms of next generation sequencing. So this slide illustrates the different components that could comprise the test. These components can include the instrumentation, <laughs> the reagents, software, and databases. Uh, the device is all of the components that will take a specimen, whether it is DNA, whole blood, saliva, urine, or any other sample type, and transforms it into a result that will be included in the lab report. In this illustration, the area that um, we boxed in typically uh, is what we would consider the device and what we would be looking for information, either in a pre-submission if you are uh, seeking feedback on it or if uh, it's in an IDE. This is the part that we would want, um, you know, analytical validation and the most information on. It is important to understand that some of this work may be done by a third party. For example, maybe a third party sequences the samples or maybe a third party performs the analysis and interpretation of the raw signals, these components, even when performed by a third party, are still part of the investigational device. So when is someone an investigator? The term investigator is defined in the IDE regulations as the individual who actually conducts a clinical investigation. That is, under whose immediate direction the test article is administered or dispensed or use involving a subject or, the, or in the event of an investigation conducted by a team of individuals is the responsible leader of that team. The investigator does not initiate the study. 
This is different from the definition of a sponsor. The term sponsor is defined in the IDE regulations as the person who initiates but who does not actually conduct the investigation. That is, the investigational device is administered, dispensed, or used under the immediate direction of another individual. A person other than an individual that uses one or more of its own employees to conduct an investigation that has initiated is a sponsor, not a sponsor investigator, and the employees are investigators. The third possibility here is the sponsor investigator. The term is defined in the IDE regulations as the individual who both initiates and actually conducts, alone or with others, an investigation. That is, under whose immediate direction the investigational device is administered, dispensed, or used. The term does not include any person other than an individual. The obligations of a sponsor investigator under this part include those of an investigator and those of a sponsor. So who is responsible for the investigational device? Um, in this case, it's the sponsor or the sponsor investigator. Either one of these um, is responsible for, for the regulatory requirements of the investigational device. And these are some common um, misconceptions that we hear related to this topic. You know, that something is not a test, it's a process. It's not an in vitro diagnostic if it's, not, if it's in the research and development stage. It's not an in vitro diagnostic if they don't plan to market the test. The ID regulations do not apply if you're not developing a test that you intend to market. And uh, that if you have CLIA certification, you don't need to worry about the IDE regulations. So what if you're not sure about the use of a device in your protocol, if you're not sure that it meets the definition of an investigational device, if you're not sure you need an IDE, uh, or if you have any questions regarding the regulatory re requirements of, uh, of your investigation. You know, you can use the pre-submission program, and we are mindful um, about the time requirements that people have or the cons uh, constraints that you may have. Um, you know, this program is free, and um, it's non-binding. So, um, and we do have 75 days, but we do, we're reasonable with, you know, the content. If we get something that we can review, um, you know, within 45, 50, 60 days, that's our aim is to be reasonable with the time that we take with our review. Um, <coughs> You know, you can use the pre-submission program to meet with the FDA for non-binding discussions and advice. The program can be used to get questions answered or for study risk determinations. There's a specific uh, type of, of submission where, you, where we help you with the, with, with the risk determination. You know, we can review your protocol to determine if uh, you're exempt from the IDE regulation if you're non-significant risk um, and subject to the abbreviated requirements of the IDE, or if the study is a significant risk study. We do encourage early interactions with FDA before you conduct your studies. Sort of when you're designing your studies, it's probably the best time to talk to us uh, to get um, you know, timely uh, interaction with the agency in case there are regulatory requirements that, uh, that you are responsible for. Um, our link to the program is provided um, here, and this provides details and instructions if you choose to use the program, and this is voluntary. Uh, these are some other resources that may help um, you figure out your regulatory requirements as, as needed, um, and it's some guidance documents. We have a device advice uh, section on our webpage, which is actually uh, very, very helpful. I, use it often myself when, I, uh, when I'm looking through uh, questions. Um, and that's it for me. Um, there are, on the agenda, there's other um, more specific things about the IDEs and, uh, you know, m more description on the process, and that's going to be discussed later uh, by David. So thank you.